tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Hello, Heartlanders, and welcome to episode 21 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the stories tonight are delightful. In a creepy sort of way, that is. I grew up in Wisconsin and had my fair share of frightful weather and dealing with snow and ice. Both of tonight's stories remind me of an incident of strange tracks in the snow and ice too thin. My brother told me the tracks in the snow were snipe tracks, and I followed them into the woods. My tracking led to a frozen creek I thought was sturdy enough to support me. One step and I broke through the ice, one leg soaking wet up to my crotch. Dad wasn't too crazy our Sunday walk in the woods was cut short. I didn't mean to wrap my brother out. I really wanted to track that snipe down and said as much. Needless to say, I learned snipes were not real, and my brother learned from dad that wasn't a funny joke. At least not to dad, anyway. Two wintertime tales brought to you by Eli Pope and a first-timer to Fear from the Heartland, Charlotte O'Farrell. Let's get after it. Christmas, a time of giving and sharing, loving and appreciating. Sometimes, though, for many, it's a time of sadness and loneliness. Cold felt bone deep. The sound of Christmas music in the distance brings joy to some and misery to others. But who could resist hearing that one song, melodic and almost haunting as it ushers in Christmas from the midnight Eve church service, Silent Night. Imagine two lonely young people's struggle, suddenly united born from a gift on a snowy Christmas Eve. Why, something so beautiful could break even the coldest heart of a devil, couldn't it? And now, for your indulgence, The Drowning Pond by Eli Pope. Chapter One Tanner Lee Pelper, or Tilper, as people had called him even before he could remember, sat on the old rustic bench he had put by the pond years ago. His pole sat leaned against the limb that jutted towards him from the water. It was his fishing branch, and his bobber slowly floated in circles. He figured the worm below the surface must be wriggling, attempting to escape the hook its slim, dangly, twisting body hid. Tilper noticed the tiny rings that echoed out and away from the red and white plastic ball. The liquid palpitations mesmerized him into a state of hypnosis as each movement of the worm created another ring cascading across the glassy surface topside. Certainly such wriggles would entice a hungry bass or possibly trout. Tilper's spring-fed pond stretched out about three and a half acres. It sat south through the woods of his property, a lengthy walking distance from his home. Tilper's parents had left him the homestead he had grown up on and still resided. All 35 acres were wooded with steep hills and rocky ridges surrounding his pond. The walnut and oak trees camouflaged several small cave openings. The Little Sack River skirted one edge of his property and he kept a canoe chained to a tree surrounded by brush 
about 30 feet from the shore. He knew this property well and only left it to get groceries and supplies. He held no need for people, for the most part. Winter was now on the cusp of returning and the colder weather had begun to bring the depression and pain along with the dropping of the foul leaves. Tilper felt very small and alone in the forest now that his parents were deceased. A man of only 24 shouldn't be allowed to let his life shrivel and dry up, becoming so atrophy. Living alone let the haunts of lonesomeness invade his mental state in paralyzing ways. Tilper hadn't wanted it this way, but life brings unwanted gifts along the journey sometimes. Withdrawing more each day, a little farther into the recesses of the torment he felt surrounded in. The people from the nearby town put up with him, but never really welcomed his presence. Once upon a time, his freshman year, he had been a local hero of sorts for a short time back before the accident. Nowadays, the townspeople just took his money for the supplies he purchased, but never included him in conversations or gatherings. That was fine with Tilper, though. He learned to not much care for people. After all, people hurt one another. They looked down their noses at people. People like him. Tilper would load up his groceries in his dad's old Ford truck along with his big blue gray pit bull and head back to the shack in the woods, home where he felt safe and secure. His old truck seemed to know on its own when to turn off the highway and onto the old farm road that led to the stone bridge which stood high over the Sack River. The front tires would slowly roll into the downhill curve that led to the sharp turn before crossing onto it. Tilper would idle the truck slowly across, and many times if another farmer were behind, they lay onto their horn in hopes of pushing old Tilper to pick up speed so they could pass as soon as they crossed and left the narrow bridge behind. It never worked, and Tilper would ignore the yells through their windows and the mean finger they would display at him. He had never responded back with the like, and I imagined that more than likely prodded their anger for him even further. On cold nights, Tilper would work on making his hand-carved fiddles right there on the cement floor of his metal shack he lived in. The home his parents and he had shared now left in a charred pile no more than a couple hundred feet from the metal storage barn he fixed up enough to live, the tin shack. Tilper missed his parents and the comforts of the home he had grown up in. The memories still seemed fresh though, and the tin shack had heat and running water. He was comfortable and satisfied with simplicity. Somehow, he had escaped the ravaging flames that night some two and a half years ago. The fire that killed both of his parents along with destroying the home. Sometimes after a rain, the scent of fire and burning wood remained and wafted over to the tin shack, reminding Tilper of what he had lost and somehow lived through. He had been blamed at first by the townspeople for setting the fire, which of course was ludicrous. He loved his parents and had no one else other than them. What would be the reasoning? There was no insurance money. Their family was poor and struggled for everything they had. All that was left to him that hadn't been burned up was the 35 acres, a 1976 ugly Ford F-150 truck, and the tin shack, heated by firewood. It did have plumbing and was insulated with pieces of random styrofoam, but it was nothing to look at and surely held little value monetarily. No, he'd have held no reason to burn everything up. Chapter 2 Tilper sat on a stool in front of the Ben Franklin stove which was tightly snuggled into the corner of his shack near the front door. The warming flames rippled and sparkled from the stacked logs within. The crackles and pops filled in the background of the otherwise emptiness of his home. Wheeler, his best and only real friend, lay sleeping on the wadded-up comforter next to his feet. Tilper nestled the piece of thin walnut in his lap and lightly pulled a razor-sharp hand scraper across the hourglass-shaped piece of wood honing its body into a smooth-to-touch perfect piece. The dark grain was beautiful and would make a very handsome instrument when he was completed. The perfect Christmas present for the only girl he had ever had eyes for, Emily Sue Merriweather. He remembered before the accident, she had asked his fellow teammate about him. It had made the school buzz. One of the prettiest girls asking about the awkward wide receiver for the Ashgrove Pirates. The memory still came to mind after all these years passed. 
Just the sound of Tilper silently speaking her name in thought sent chords of a lovely melody throughout his veins. She had been the only one outside his family that gave him happy thoughts. She had been nice to him back in their school days when so many others were not. She too had stayed in the area while many of the others moved off after graduating high school. She played violin and played beautifully even way back then. He would hear her throughout the years at the town's festivals or at church. He was a silent admirer from a quiet distance, never feeling in her league to move forward in any way other than a little wave or smile from the crowd. Even after the praise of his football abilities, he never felt worthy enough to approach Emily Sue. Something Tilper never had been privy to was that Emily Sue, even with her beauty, had grown up feeling very similar to his feelings of inadequacies to the social life of high school and the other kids. Tilper, nor Emily Sue, had no conditions mentally or medically to be so withdrawn. It was just the circumstances of makeup. Quiet, withdrawn families that each stuck to themselves, rarely venturing out much with others other than church. Small towns can be difficult cultures to break into if you live on the outskirts and aren't outwardly overt to others. Families can quickly become labeled poorly among the small cliques. This is the unfortunate outcome of the Pappers and the Merriweathers. Hours would pass as Tilper scraped and honed the wooden parts he created from the old downed walnut tree on his property. He shaped and formed the wooden pieces into an incredible piece of musical art. While he tried to play back in school, he could never master much more than sour screeches and poorly tuned notes. What he lacked in musical talent, he made up in woodcrafting. He would be able to finish the gift for Emily Sue before the church's Christmas celebration in two weeks. Now he'd just need to muster up the courage to give his gift to the only girl he ever admired and was sweet on, but lacked the courage in letting her know his secret. Chapter 3 Rodney Lane Miles was the starring quarterback in 1978. It was the year Tilper and he ruled the field together and stunned the town of Ashgrove while putting it on the map. The magic of Rodney's bold passing game and Tilper's hands, managing to catch anything thrown close to him was a perfect combination. Rodney had held doubts at first when he met Tilper. After all, Tilper didn't really look or act like someone of knowledge, talent, or love of the game. Rodney's family recently moved into the area from Kansas City. He had grown up football. After the first several summer practices, Rodney sensed a talent in Tilper. He befriended him that first year as much as one could befriend an odd kid like Tilper. That first game was magical. The two couldn't seem to miss. They slaughtered Greenfield 42 to nothing. The local news channels went crazy talking up that first game. Rodney and Tilper soon became the talk of town. Unfortunately, after a 10-0 winning streak, the magic died instantly. The brain injury that was caused by a nasty tackle on Tilper at the 10-yard line ended his short-lived winning career with high school football and the Pirates. He was out for the last game of the season and even after recovery, never came back to the field ever again. Soon. The kindred friendship with Rodney went sour also. Neil Ballard took Tilper's place alongside Rodney for the last game and shoulder to shoulder at school. That last game of Rodney's first season on the Pirates ended in a horrible loss. Neil had kept up on receiving touchdown passes all the way until halftime. It appeared Neil was the perfect replacement for Tilper. But something went south and they ended the Rodney and Tilper's previous winning season with a 28-41 loss and to a team whose record had been 2-8. and eight. Ashgrove's next two seasons with Rodney and Neil failed miserably. Their fame withered away. The simple truth was, Rodney resented Tilper from that tragic night of the injury till he graduated. The talk was that he also pursued Emily Sue just to spite Tilper, knowing how he quietly felt about her. Now, though, it was water far under the bridge. Rodney ended up joining the Army after graduation and soon his family left Ashgrove too. Emily Sue never gave in to Rodney's attempts to date. Life moved by slowly and quietly, admirations silent and unknown. Everyone always questioned why Emily Sue, so pretty of a girl, never dated or found anyone to be serious with. No one ever thought about Tilper being single though. In fact, 
no one ever thought much of anything about Tilper. He just faded off into obscurity as the awkward, quiet boy whose parents died in a suspicious fire outside of town. No one even remembered he had been a huge part of the 1978 nearly undefeated winning season of the Pirates. The year Ashgrove High ended up losing the state championship. Deep down, Rodney held Tilper accountable throughout his last two years as they never repeated another winning season, besides the games that he and Tilper had ruled playing together up until the injury that stole the magic. Chapter 4 Emily Sue Merriweather laid the receipt for the meal on Joe Massey's table. I hope everything met your satisfaction, Mr. Massey. Emily Sue, I've been coming in here every morning for the last 30 years. About 16 years longer than you've been working here. You do know my name is Joe, don't you? He smiled as he stuck the toothpick into the gap between his two front teeth. Damn it, girl. You make me feel old with the Mr. Stuff. I'm sorry, Mr. I mean, Joe. I surely don't want to make you feel that way. I guess I just feel the need to show respect. I'll try not to make you feel old again. You gonna play violin this Christmas at the church again? You sure have an ear and talent, Emily Sue. She blushed. Why, thank you, Joe. And yes, I plan on it. Pastor Jesse expects it every year now. He says the Christmas Eve service wouldn't be the same without it. Joe smiled. Pastor Jesse would be correct. If I happen to be short of the proper spirit of Christmas up till Christmas Eve, your beautiful violin playing always speeds me back into that spirit of joy at the last minute. Sometimes that's difficult now that the missus passed. I'm sure it's difficult this time of year, Joe. My thoughts and prayers will be with you in mind, and I'll do my best to usher the proper spirit into your holiday. Emily Sue heard the familiar sound of a certain Ford truck and shifted her gaze toward the window just in time to see Tilper's old truck idle down Main Street past Lydia's diner. Tilper quickly looked to his left to see if he'd catch a glimpse of Emily Sue at a table. Yep, there she was. This is the year I'm going to give Miss Merriweather a Christmas present. Tilper quickly turned when he saw Emily Sue look out the window his way. He swore he noticed a sweet smile and glimmer in her eye. Nah, surely not. Just my imagination. Chapter 5 It was Christmas Eve and the temperature had dropped very timely in the last several weeks. Thanksgiving was unseasonably warm and Tilper was glad the odd and untimely heat wave had retreated, bringing normal temperatures and the possible chance for snow back into the area's forecast. He looked at the single wrapped gift neatly tucked under his freshly cut cedar tree. Wheeler peeked up from his comforter bed on the floor with his sad eyes and tail gently beginning to wag at the sight of his master eyeing him. Do you think she'll accept my gift, Wheeler? Will she like it? Tilper calmly asked. Wheeler's tail wagged with more gusto and steadiness. So you think so, buddy? Tilper smiled. He hoped he hadn't overdone it. He had barely squeaked out a hello every time he had gone to get scrambled eggs, bacon, and pancakes at Lydia's diner. They were tasty, but he couldn't really afford to eat them as regularly as he had liked. He just had to see Emily Sue's sweet face at least a time or two every week. She always treated him so nicely at the diner, and at Sunday church, of course. Tilper was proud of the instrument he had made, it was by far the best he had completed to date. He even hand-carved a pair of beautiful intertwined hearts on the face just below the bottom sound hole. He had hoped she liked it and wouldn't be too embarrassed or bothered by the carving. It was a one of a kind. He had bleached the carved hearts so they were lighter than the walnut and then had mixed a special red dye and stained them. They had just the right hint of red as to not stick out too boldly, but were visible. He also carved his name on the back, Tilper. Even Emily Sue called him by his nickname. He wasn't sure anyone really knew his given name was Tanner Lee. It was as if it really weren't. The only time he had been called Tanner Lee was by his mama. Even his daddy called him Tilper. He looked outside as the sun began to drop below the horizon. His little tin shack sat in the middle of the woods 
and even though most all vegetation was long gone from the trees and shrubs, it still became darker around his shack quicker than anywhere else. He could hardly wait until tonight's midnight service. Tonight would be special. Chapter 6 There were the beginnings of a good dusting of snow as Tilper's old Ford rolled onto the parking lot of Pastor Jesse's church. Several cars were already parked, and the stained glass windows appeared extra beautiful behind the snowflakes wafting down slowly. It just looked warm and inviting inside. It was Christmas Eve, and Tilper's heart felt warm with the spirit of giving. He had worn his best clothes and carried in his beautifully wrapped package. He hoped to see Emily Sue first thing, while he had his courage up. As he walked through the front door, he immediately spied Pastor Jesse. Pastor, sir, Merry Christmas. Is Emily Sue here yet? He spit the sentences out so quickly it drew a smile from Jesse Gibson. Why, yes she is, Dilper. She's in the choir room readying herself for the program. You're free to peek in and wish her Merry Christmas. I'm sure she'd love that. Thank you, sir. That's why I came a bit early. I, uh, I, I have a present, a present for her, sir. I was thinking that beautiful gift looked very intriguing. I'm certain she will cherish whatever it is. Jesse nodded and smiled and held out his hand for the Jenkins, who just stepped in behind Tilper. Thank you, sir. I'll just go see her real quick, like. I won't keep her too long, sir. Tilper nervously walked to the choir room door and stood for a second. He was trying to work up the courage to turn the doorknob. Here you go, Tilper. Bobby reached over and twisted the knob, pushing the door wide open. Sometimes it sticks. Emily Sue's eyes shot to the opening door, half startled. For some reason, her nerves got the best of her every time just before showtime. Her eyes appeared as two startled full moons for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, Emma, Emily Sue. I did mean, I mean, Bobby, push the door. Her look of being startled quickly morphed into a warm smile. It's okay, Tilper, really. I'm glad you came in. I'm just nervous and, you know, jitters and all. But Merry Christmas, Tilper. I'm glad to see you. You are kind of a sight for sore eyes. I'm calmer now. Merry Christmas, Emily Sue. I am, uh, I made... I made this for you. I've wanted to do this for some time now, and, well, Christmas seemed like the perfect time. I hope it's okay i done this. He nervously held out the gift towards her as she walked closer to him. Oh, Tilper, it's wrapped beautifully, but you shouldn't have. Christmas is the giving time, and... Tilper stepped closer and put the package into Emily Sue's hands and stepped back. You don't have to open it now. You can just take it with you after after the service if you want. Tilper, I wouldn't dream of not opening it in front of you. She motioned with a head nod toward the row of chairs. Please, please sit down with me. I've got plenty of time to see what's inside this beautiful wrapping. They both sat like nervous school kids back in the time of high school and nerves and butterflies in the stomach. They slowly sat and Emily Sue glanced up at Tilper as she held the gift on her lap. You look really handsome tonight. I mean, not that you don't always. Should I open it now? She asked timidly. Of course, Emily Sue. I was hoping you wouldn't wait until later. Who knows, you might could use it sooner than you thought. Well, now you've got my curiosity up. Her fingers carefully slid under the fold of the taped paper as she slowly slid her finger the length of the box. I can't even imagine. I wish I could say I had a gift for you, but I had no idea that... It's okay, Emily Sue. I didn't expect a thing. The only gift I want is to watch your eyes sparkle as you open it. That's really sweet of you to say. She peeled back the paper and began to edge her fingernail into the tape that held the box flaps closed. After finally breaking the seal all the way around the top of the box, she looked up at Tilper with question. Is it okay to open it now? Of course it is, Emily Sue. It's yours. Tilper's eyes glistened with the excitement of a young boy on Christmas morning with gifts awaiting his hands to tear into. 
As she opened the flaps up and parted the tissue paper, one hand immediately went to her lips. Oh, it's beautiful, Tilper. A tear gently popped from her eye and began the slow descent down her cheek. She lifted her eyes up and looked directly into Tilper's. This is the most beautiful present I've ever received. Did you make this? She lifted it from the tissue and held it gently up to study it. Her lips mouthed, oh my, as she noticed the delicate carved and stained hearts and then turned to look at its back and noticed his carved signature. I absolutely love it and will treasure it forever. She leaned over and with one arm reached around Tilper and pulled him into a hug. She pulled back and began to put the violin back into the box. I've got to put it down for a moment and give you a proper thank you hug. She turned back around and put both arms around him. Pulling him close enough, she whispered into his ear, I love this, Tilper. It means everything to me. How completely unexpected and sweet of you. She pulled closer again and maneuvered to where her lips could meet his for a kiss. That was when the door swung open suddenly. When they quickly pulled away from each other, no one other than Rodney was standing in the doorway. He looked shocked. Tilper? Emily Sue? Neither Emily Sue nor Tilper knew why they felt as if they had been caught in some horrible act, but the awkwardness set in quickly. I've got to prepare. Rodney, could you please close the door? Tilper, I want you to stay for a minute, please. The door banged to a close and Tilper quickly began to apologize. You have no reason to apologize for anything. You've done a very generous and loving thing by spending all of the time it must have taken to create this beautiful gift. I'll never forget it or let anything happen to it. It's gorgeous. And you, you are such a wonderful Christmas gift yourself. I'm very blessed tonight, and I want you to know how much you mean to me. Can we maybe go for a walk in the snow after the service or something? I won't want this Christmas Eve to end tonight now. You just gave me the best gift ever, Emily Sue. Your smile and a walk together on the best night I've ever had. He smiled. Now you need to prepare, and I need to go sit down and regroup these new emotions I'm feeling. Emily Sue smiled and pushed her lips in a quick kiss as Tilper turned and pushed the door to a soft close. As the lights went dimmer in the sanctuary, the beautiful melodic sound echoed throughout the Christmas-filled room. The pews all held garlands on the ends, there were several Christmas trees decorated with white and red ribbon and angels. Candles filled the room and flickered as the Christmas carols echoed beautiful and willowy from a marvelous walnut violin showcasing two hearts intertwined as Emily Sue's hand moved the bow in an orchestrated dance back and forth across the strings. She looked the happiest she had ever looked and people whispered such back and forth to each other. At the close of the service, the congregation each held candles and sang Silent Night together to the wispy sound quietly singing out the melodic tune everyone knew so well. As each blew out their candle before heading out into the snow in their homes, Rodney calmly walked over to his old football friend he hadn't seen for at least five years and whispered in his ear in nearly a hushed sentence no one else could make out. Your silent night is coming. It'll be a cold one too. You'll see. Tilper swore he saw the devil dancing in Rodney's eyes as he turned and walked out into the cold of the night. But Tilper's heart still felt so warm from Emily Sue's kiss, he shrugged the thought of Rodney and his threat off, instead choosing to hold warm thoughts and Emily Sue's hand as they walked around the snowy streets of Ash Grove's downtown. Snowflakes slowly danced around them as the colored lights in the window fronts twinkled on and off. Chapter 7 Tilper's eyes began to open. Wheeler stretched his legs and pushed on Tilper's back. Yep, queen-size bed, and once again, Wheeler has somehow scooted me to the very edge. As he pushed back against Wheeler, he began the struggle to roll over and surmise his dog's lying position. There sat three-quarters of unused bed, while he had been almost shoved off the side. Wheeler... If it wasn't Christmas morning, I'd... He shook his head while Wheeler lifted his up and stared at him with big brown loving eyes. Well, I wouldn't do nothing, and you know it. Both dropped their heads back down to the pillow. Tilper had no idea what Wheeler was thinking, 
but he himself couldn't wipe the big smile from his face. Last night was the best. He rolled back over to face Wheeler and threw his arm over him, rubbing the top of his head. Boy, life is different today. Very different. Merry Christmas. And he reached over, opening the drawer on his nightstand. He grabbed a brand new bright yellow tennis ball and tossed it toward the foot of the bed. Wheeler snapped around and almost beat the ball to the foot. The snow continued to fall most of Christmas Day. Tilper had invited Emily Sue over for an evening Christmas dinner. He spent late morning cleaning the house spotless. He hummed and whistled throughout, never dropping the smile he wore. About seven o'clock, Tilper began to worry something had gone wrong. Emily Sue should have been there by now. He knew she was a punctual kind of person and would have called if she had changed her mind. The telephone rang and broke the silence. As Tilper reached to pick it up, he suddenly felt relief. Something must have kept her running late. Hello? A familiar voice spoke out, but it sounded cold and harsh. Tilper, Tilper, little lover boy. Hello? Is this, is this Rodney? This is your devil, Tilper, a Grinch if you will, to come and steal your fucking Christmas. What do you mean, Rodney? Are you still mad about the game? Or Emily Sue? I got a present for you, little Tilper. It's down at your pond. Better hurry. Run fast. Click. The line went dead. Tilper grabbed for his Carhartt jacket, leaving Wheeler behind as the door quickly slammed closed. He was running in as long a stride as he could through the snow and down the trails towards the pond. It was cold and the ground was slick, spilling him to his knees several times. His determination was strong, but he was becoming winded, his heart pounding. He couldn't think. Why would Rodney be doing this? And on Christmas? Why was he even back in town? He had no family here, no friends. The only people left here in Ash Grove from those days were he and Emily Sue. He panted as icicles began to form in his mustache and goatee. The pond never seemed this far away. He suddenly had to stop a minute. He was sucking cold, moist air into his lungs and it hurt. It burned deep within. He couldn't imagine what would be down at the pond for him to see. Would he be waiting there? Was he wanting to hurt him? Oh shit, he thought. Wheeler wasn't with him. What if he needed him? His heart began to race even more and he lifted his body upward from where he had been bent over, hands on his knees, attempting to catch his breath. I can't go back for Wheeler now. I gotta go. As Tilper raced down the hill, tromping through small drifts of snow, his hands bouncing grip from one tree to the other, he was about to reach his fishing spot when something caught his eye. There was a strange reddish clump in the middle of the pond and an odd stick figure poking up that he couldn't make out. His eyes scanned the area as he slowed to a fast-paced walk, attempting to make out what the debris in the water was and the tree line surrounding, in case Rodney or whatever was there waiting for him. His breath shot from his nose and mouth. The cold air steamed from his body. Sounds of strain escaped his lips along with the sucking of air back in. His eyes were blurred and he attempted to wipe them clear with his cold fingers. There was silence. No birds, no squirrels, nothing but the noises he made. He began walking again towards the edge of the pond, staring and trying to make out what was out there. It didn't make sense. Where are you, Rodney? He cried out. I'm here, damn it. What do you want from me? As he came to the edge of the creek, he noticed something. All around, as far as he could see, the water's edge held a thin layer of ice, from the ground's edge and out about a foot and a half or two. Everywhere, but one small spot about 30 feet from where he stood and to the left. That's when he noticed footprints in the snow that seemed disturbed and disrupted. Something appeared to have been dragged or been in a scuffle. The closer he looked, the more he saw that weeds and brush were bent over and it just didn't look as if it matched the rest of the pristine white untouched grounds. Tilper's eyes trailed from where the disturbance in the snow started, up just inside the tree line and then he made his eyes follow the trail back down towards the pond's edge. He looked from the broken ice out to the center to the reddish clump with the odd twig, and that's when his heart slammed to a halt. His breath ceased, and his mind went temporarily numb until something clicked, and his legs began tromping quickly through the water to the center and the object. No, no, please God, no! 
Tears poured from his eyes, mixing with the splashes coming up off his knees, the cold, chilled wetness slamming into his face and stinging. The roar of moving water quickly began to flood his ears. It's all he could hear except for his own voice screaming, God, no, please, no. As he almost reached the floating clump, his mind rationalized what the twig had been. It was the violin neck he had made. It was rising from the clump of wet clothing or something. He struggled through the frigid water to get closer, only to realize it was a half-clothed body. He reached it and grabbed what he could to pull it up. An opened, torn red dress parted enough to see pale white and frozen skin. He lifted it with everything he had and began backing up towards land, hollering, Emily Sue, please be okay, please. He backed as fast as he could until he tripped, pulling Emily Sue's body on top of him as he fell backwards and became swallowed up by the cold pond water. Emily Sue's body that he clung tightly to began crushing him further underwater as his clothes became heavily soaked and saturated. The more he struggled, the more entangled he became in the cold silt and weeds. It pulled him deeper, and he struggled to catch his breath, only to suck in nearly frozen silt stirred water. He fought to climb back to the top. His eyes could see the dim light through the murky water, his face and mouth just inches away, but it may as well have been hundreds of feet. His strength could no longer find any fight, and he refused to loosen his grip of Emily Sue in his attempts to keep her above the surface. His mind wouldn't let him acknowledge she was already long gone. All his brain would do was sacrifice to save her, his one love that had finally become real. Up on top of the hill, behind several trees, sat the devil himself, deep inset eyes, cold of death and destruction, staring with intensity at Tilper's struggle below as he was being swallowed up by death. Rodney had died several months before. Hate and jealousy was his demon he had succumbed to. He had watched his chance at fame die quickly when the better half of talent he shared suffered the horrible, debilitating injury from a pass he had thrown so poorly. It had been a miracle Tilper had even caught it. Unfortunately, at the price of stretching out far enough to catch it, that his maneuver left him wide open to the harsh tackle that took him out of the game. Rodney knew deep down that his pass had been the cause and fall of the team's winning streak and loss of his once best friend and teammate. His psyche wouldn't allow him to accept that fact, so he sought to place blame and cause destruction to his friend. He tried to hurt him as repayment by stealing the only girl Tilper ever loved. Rodney couldn't give up his vengefulness after never repeating any football success, even years after moving away and joining the army. His misguided hate followed him through drugs and booze, and finally a deal made with the devil. A deal he wasn't even able to do more than orchestrate. The devil wouldn't allow him to watch his final deed. Just another price to pay for hell. The devil was enjoying it, though. He wanted little innocent Tilper from day one. Emily Sue was just collateral damage. The devil's eyes glowed at the sight they took in. Christmas. <laughs> he hissed. The devil was so busy relishing in his cruelness that he never saw the beast coming, never heard its run through the buffeting snow, the cold layer that killed any sound of what was about to hit. Wheeler plunged forward, paws outward in the air as he flew the last few feet, his jaws wide open and sharp fangs digging into Satan's laughing throat. Silence had filled the pond where Tilper and Emily Sue now rested below the surface, cold and rigid. Death had swallowed up Tilper's and Emily Sue's Christmas love and future. Wheeler's jaws, though, held tight as he and the devil rolled down the hillside, tumbling with hideous screams from hell until they spilled into the cold water's edge of the drowning pond to the sizzling hisses of a demon's instant death. To this day, some people say if you quietly walk down to Tilper's pond on a snowy Christmas day, you'll see Tilper and Emily Sue holding hands, sitting on the old rustic bench and hear beautiful chilling sounds emanating through the trees from his handmade violin gift given on that one extraordinary snowy Christmas Eve. Several feet down the shore by the spot where Tilper drowned at the water's edge still sits Wheeler, his blue-gray pit bull mix, patiently waiting, eyes fixed on the water's surface for his master to reappear and come home. I sure hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, written by Eli Pope. 
Eli Pope is a major writing contributor for Fear from the Heartland. Eli began his love of creating stories back in high school creative writing classes. The passion laid dormant for decades while life took him different directions. The stories never left, and he finally succumbed to the voices in his head telling him to put them on paper. And put them on paper he did, earning the Literary Titan Award for all four books of the Mason Jar series, The Judgment Game, The Spark of Wrath, The Glass House, and The Reclamation, which you, dear listener, can hear on audible.com, performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. The only thing I will tell you, Billy J. Cater is a bad dude. You can hook up with Eli Pope at his website, elipope.com. That's Eli, E-L-I, Pope, P-O-P-E, dot com. He can also be located on Facebook at author Eli Pope, or search groups on Facebook, The Mason Jar Room. A young man has a burning desire to be a journalist. Like any aspiring writer, he is looking for that first juicy story that will set his career in motion. When his editor sends him on a Christmas Eve trip in a snowstorm to check out some weird tracks in the snow, he is confident this isn't the story that will put him on the map. When death and mayhem ensue, he is forever changed. And now, for your indulgence, The Devil's Footprints by Charlotte O'Farrell. Growing up, my dream was to be a journalist. Maybe I'd watched too many movies, but I loved the idea of chasing down big stories and going undercover to investigate huge scoops. Mingling with the rich and famous and being first on the scene of major historical events seemed impossibly glamorous. I got my first job as a rookie reporter on my hometown paper when I graduated back in 1995. You won't be surprised to hear that it didn't exactly live up to my starry-eyed expectations. But hey, every journey starts with a single step, right? Most of the work was dull, reporting on local amateur dramatic society's plays and charity events, and writing the obituaries. My quiet little town skewed elderly even back then, so there was never a shortage of those to write. But it was thrilling to see my byline somewhere other than my school paper. The editor seemed pleased with my work, so she gave me my own recurring column. It was called How Strange, and it looked at some of the funnier, weirder stories around town. Once I interviewed an old woman who claimed her house was haunted by the ghost of Jack the Ripper. She could never quite answer my question about how Jack had ended up spending eternity in a semi-detached house three hours' drive from London, but she wouldn't be swayed. The idea caught on. Soon I was writing about the local stories of a wild panther stalking the streets of our quiet town center in the dead of night and the spate of garden gnomes turning up in people's gardens with no explanation. Of course, the panther was a large pet cat, and of course the gnomes were just a rather wholesome teenage prank. But it was good fun to write, and the letters I'd get for it were hilarious. Another time, I investigated the mysterious disappearances of two of the town's more infamous road signs, bottom hole and fanny hands way. Part of the fun was how obvious it was that this was the work of local kids giggling at the names. Both signs had been stolen hundreds of times by generations of kids, displaying them proudly in their bedrooms like trophies. But I played it straight, writing as if this was a truly strange disappearance, even hinting that aliens or ghosts might be behind it. The week before my first Christmas on the job, I had just made up the story behind how strange. Something for the kids to enjoy about how Santa's elves have been spotted in town, searching out the local pubs for a place for their boss to rest on Christmas Eve night. Honestly, the standard of letters had been a bit low that week, so none of the real ones had much life in them. I hoped it might pick up after New Year. On Christmas Eve itself, just me and my editor were working. Everyone else had taken the day off. I was hoping she'd let me go early. It was very snowy. The paper's next edition was finalized and, barring some huge story the likes of which the town had never seen, we could just sit back and relax. 
Or so I hoped. Got a story for you. She said the moment I walked in. We've had a call-in. I was just taking my snow-covered coat off and getting used to the warmth, so this wasn't a welcome comment. What, on Christmas Eve? Oh, don't worry. You'll like this one. She sat forward in her chair and clasped her hands together the way she always did when she was excited. This is right up your street, you know, Newtown? I nodded. It was a tiny village just a mile or two to the east of our town. Well, they woke up today after the storm and they found footprints in the snow. I laughed at that. Was she playing with me? Footprints in the snow, seriously? So what? She leaned even further over the desk, getting increasingly animated. They're calling them the Devil's Footprints. They're shaped like hooves and they go all through the town, on roofs, across streams, up walls. <laughs> it's wild. I laughed again and covered my face with my hands. Oh, come on. I'm serious. This would make an amazing column for How Strange. It's just some kids playing a joke or some weird animal. They're probably mouse tracks or something. Badgers, foxes. My editor raised her eyebrows. So what? She said quietly. I told you my dream was to be a journalist, right? And I knew it wasn't always going to be a glamorous route to the top. But as I dusted the snow off the newspaper's small motorbike and prepared to travel on country roads to some shitty little village on Christmas Eve, I almost reconsidered my career. My dad had warned me to go into law instead. Once I got on the road, there was no time for regrets. I was concentrating on not ending up as roadkill. The snow had started to turn to slush on some of the side roads, and the motorbike was tiny and unreliable. There was no way of spotting potholes before my front wheel went bashing into them. How I made it to Newtown that day, I'll never know. I was in such a bad mood by the time I drove into that place, but I felt something, perhaps a stirring of curiosity at least, when I saw the people of the village standing outside. They were in lines, holding umbrellas over the snow on the ground while letting themselves be covered in the still gently falling flurry. I pulled up beside a cluster of people and hopped off my motorbike. One of the crowd grabbed my arm. Careful where you stand. He hissed, nodding towards the ground. And that's when I first saw them, the so-called devil's footprints in the snow. I had to admit, I saw what they meant. They did look like they had come from something with cloven hooves. There was a big gap between each one, so whatever it was that had left these had a long stride too. I shook my arm away from the old guy who had grabbed it. So this is where the tracks are then? I said. Not just here, all over the place. On walls, up on rooftops, he replied, his voice shaking. And right up to the river too. Up to the bank on one side and then straight back up on the other, like it just walked clean across. I raised my eyebrows. For all my resentment about being sent out here on Christmas Eve, now they had my attention. I bent down in the snow and inspected the footprints. They were surprisingly deep. Whoever and whatever had left them had been stamping on the ground with some force. I got my camera out of the underseat holding space on the motorbike and started to snap photos. Walking at a distance, I followed the tracks. Newtown was a picturesque little place in the snow. It looked like an illustration in a genteel old children's book, like a quaint English village from an imaginary yesteryear. Everywhere I went, I saw the residents crowding around the footprints, baffled. If this was a hoax, not all of them were in on it. That was for sure. Some looked frightened. My mind was whirring as I took photos by the river. If this was the work of pranksters, it was quite complex. They'd have needed to get up in the early morning, make the footprints, I'm not sure what with, and somehow manage to conceal their own footprints alongside the fake ones. And if they were animal tracks, while well, they weren't like the tracks of any animal I'd ever seen before. There was only one place in the village that didn't have any of the weird footprints, the churchyard. The tracks moved around it, circling around it, before heading back into the village. I was taking some photos of the untouched snow in the churchyard when I saw the vicar walking over, dressed in snow boots, 
crunching on the path as he went. He was about 45 with flyaway Mad Professor style hair and wire framed glasses. Have you seen anything like this before? He asked quietly. I shook my head. Never in my life. You? Well, I read about a similar incident. In Devon, in the 1850s. Tracks appearing overnight in the snow, with no explanation. He looked around as if worried we'd be overheard. They called them the Devil's Footprints then, too. I stopped taking photos and looked the vicar in the eye. And do you think they are the Devil's Footprints? He met my gaze for a moment and paused. A beat too late, he laughed. It sounded quite forced. <laughs> of course not. Just a strange superstition, I expect. Those isolated villages in the snow, it can be easy to imagine things when you're this closed off from the rest of society. He gestured to my camera. Still, it'll make a good newspaper story. I watched him walk slowly back to his church, being careful not to slip on the snow. Something about the brief interaction really unnerved me, but I couldn't figure out why. I watched him retreat. Walking back to the center of the village, I bent down and examined the footprints again. Some strange urge to touch them overcame me. I moved my fingers slowly forwards until just the tips were touching the indentation in the snow and felt a burning shock jolt through my arm. Crying out, I fell backwards into the snow. What the fuck? I shouted. I looked at my fingers. They were red and sore, but didn't look as if they'd been burned. I shook my head and tried again, more timid this time. When I put my fingers into a footprint, there was nothing but snow. After the pain of that first shock, it almost felt soothing. I was squatting there, gently moving my fingers around the snowy hoof prints of God knows what, when I heard the first screams. Just one person at first, a woman, screaming at the top of her lungs. Then, more joined the chorus, louder and louder until there seemed to be dozens of them crying out hysterically. I got up and ran, instinctively towards the noise squashing a small section of the devil's footprints underfoot as I went. I found a crowd gathering around the doorway of a small semi-detached house down a side street. The door, covered with flaking baby blue paint, had been smashed open. I could tell by the broken lock. Oh my god, the kids! Look what he's done to the kids! Those were the first words I could make out amid the screams. A chill ran down my spine that had nothing to do with the snowy weather. I quickened my pace until I was standing at the edge of the panicked crowd. I saw the horrifying scene in the house in flashes. My view kept getting obstructed by the people in front of me, pushing forwards for another look at the horror. What I saw that day has burned into my brain now. There was a pile of bodies hacked up, bloodied flesh mashed together. At first glance, it was hard to tell one victim's body from another. It was as if all four of them had been placed one on top of the other their blood seeping out in rivulets across the other corpses. Each victim was naked, their bodies slashed repeatedly. Their arms and legs stuck out at odd angles. The gouge marks were so deep in some that I could see the exposed bones. One set of bloodied intestines had been thrown against the wall beside the bodies and left to fall down it slowly, leaving a trail of gore that ended in a pool of discarded viscera. As my brain adjusted to the unfathomable sight in front of me, I focused on the victim on top of the others. Her leg stood at a sickening right angle from the knee, the leg bones sticking out. Four of her fingers lay on the floor beside them as if hacked clean off. Her mutilated face, blood oozing from each slash inflicted on it, was frozen in a silent, futile scream. The dead eyes of the second victim in the pile were facing towards the door those empty eyes met mine. Turning on my heel, I vomited into the snow. I staggered backwards, away from the crowd. I didn't hear anything. A woman standing in the next door's doorway kept shouting. I was here all night and I never heard a sound. The world seemed to spin around me. I grabbed the garden fence of the house across the street and steadied myself. There were already sirens in the distance. When the ambulance arrived, they would need a ton of body bags and the police forensics team would definitely not have a happy Christmas as they sorted this mess out. I suppose I should have had my journalist's mindset on. I could have got some initial reactions, identified the name of the family whose decimated corpses were currently on show, or 
tried to get some kind of control on the situation, maybe even taken a couple of sneaky photos of the bloody aftermath. But I wasn't thinking like a journalist right then. I wasn't really thinking at all, except how much I wanted to get out of this fucking crazy situation. Next thing I knew, I was running. Where the hell had I left my motorbike? Logically, I probably shouldn't have been running away from people when there was likely a crazy psycho on the loose, but this didn't seem like a time for logic. As I crunched through the snow, I looked down and noticed with a shiver that I was running right alongside the devil's footprints. I seemed to have a similar stride, too. Anyone who came after might have thought I was going one for one in a race with Satan, but as the horror show in that doorway illustrated, that fucker was one step ahead of us all. Freaked out by my closeness to those damn snow tracks, I turned around and headed for the one place I could think of to go, the churchyard. In my panicked brain, I thought maybe the vicar would know what to do. No doubt he had more experience with death, bereavement, loss, and evil. I hopped over the old stone wall into the churchyard. I ran through the Victorian section of the graveyard, nearly tripping over some of the weathered stones. As I choked back tears, I swear I heard a faint demonic laughter on the wind. Damned if I was going to look back and see where that was coming from. I reached the vicarage, set right by the church itself. I started hammering on the door. We need you right now, please. Please, help. I shouted again and again. Nothing. No response whatsoever. That damn cackle on the breeze again, like the devil was waiting for me to notice something. I felt another deep shudder down my spine as I moved towards the window. The vicarage was small, and you could see most of the ground floor from the front window. I rubbed away at it with my sleeve and peered through. At first it looked like the vicar was floating in the air. His mouth hung open as if in shock, his head inclined to one side. That's when I spotted the noose around his neck. The vicar, or rather his dead body, was hanging from his own staircase. It had only been a few minutes since we were speaking. He must have killed himself the second he returned. I took two steps back, then fainted, falling into the snow with my arms in a crucifixion pose at my sides. It was February before my doctors let me go back to work at the newspaper. Until then, I avoided all news about the tragedies in Newtown. I laid low, gave Christmas a miss, and gave myself time to heal. It's been years since that day. In my work as a journalist, I've covered war zones, shooting sprees, and serial killings. But no story could ever get me like this one did. Over time, I've felt able to revisit the case. It's a favorite of online conspiracy theorists and New Age people alike. The official story is the most boring. The so-called devil's footprints were animal tracks, perhaps some kind of deer. The hysteria surrounding their appearance in the village contributed to the decision of a local man to kill his wife, sister-in-law, and kids before throwing himself in a river in a town a few miles north. The vicar had been depressed for some time, losing the faith he had built his life on, and his suicide around the same time as the murders were discovered was simply a coincidence. And the unofficial stories? Well, take your pick. Quite a few people have taken the route of suggesting demonic possession was to blame. What Satan was doing in a small English village just before Christmas is never fully answered. Some think the guy who killed his family went to the vicarage next and staged his final murder to look like a suicide, though there was no sign of a struggle, and I can personally attest that the timings don't work out. I've even seen a few people go out on a limb and say it was aliens that caused the tragedies that day. As for me, well, I don't like to guess. Even after this experience, I wouldn't say I believe in demons or the devil as a physical entity who causes chaos in this world. I think humans do a good enough job of that on our own. But I know what I experienced in that small village on that fateful Christmas Eve, and I can say this for sure. Something walked in Newtown that night, and whatever it was, I hope to never cross its path again. <laughs>
hope you enjoyed tonight's story, The Devil's Footprints, written by Charlotte O'Farrell. Charlotte O'Farrell is a horror writer. A lifelong fan of the genre, she writes about all manner of the weird and wonderful. Her stories have appeared in anthologies and podcasts. She writes daily flash fiction on Twitter, and you can find her there at Sha O'Farrell. That's C H A O F A R R E L L. And on Facebook at author Charlotte O'Farrell. She lives in the East Midlands of England with her husband, daughter, and cat. A shout out to our additional voice talents tonight Melissa Medina as the editor and Creepy Face as the old guy and the vicar. As for voice actress Melissa Medina, more of her work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel as well as her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H E A R M E L I S S A.com. Be sure to check her out when you can. I assure you, you won't be disappointed. If you'd like to hear more from the talented voice actor best known as Creepy Face, you can find his very own production work on the Creepy Face YouTube channel, where horror looms like a dark cloud and is welcomed with open arms. You can also find additional works right here on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel by simply searching our archives for Creepy Face. You won't be disappointed. If you enjoyed tonight's story hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S.net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.